So, Anne, over to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ken. Uh, and thanks to SFU Urban Studies and Public Square for um, uh, organizing uh, this. I'm coming to you from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people, and I'm here at 312 Main Street, the old uh, police station, which is full of all sorts of um, uh, histories and, and complicated uh, spatial politics. Um, whose city is it anyway? Who does it embrace? Who does it marginalize? And who does it push away from legibility? Whose bodies matter and whose don't? Is the right to the city just words on a page? Or are we an apartheid city as former UN Special Repertoire and Housing Maloon Katari famously called Vancouver a few years ago? In his essay, How High is the City? How Deep is Our Love? Jeff Dirksen wrote, we're often reminded that we love the city, that intimate aspects of ourselves course through the veins of the city we live in, and that a deep affection binds us to the space and places of our city. And we do love cities. Our lives are wrapped in and through the spaces and textures and possibilities of our urban experience. Through the discussion of what is possible in the city, we slowly build up the city's identity and life. Crisis and recovery conspire utopian forms of thinking as the capacity to imagine a future that departs significantly from what we know to be a general condition in the present. Uh, today, there is indeed a desire for urgency and disruption and upheaval that the moment calls for. We can't go back to addressing a crisis with a little bit of Keynesian politics sprinkled here and there. Something more fundamental is being asked for uh, by the moment. The fork in the road was passed a long time ago. Within the crisis, there's the opportunity to reaffirm, adjudicate, and jettison values and expand the sphere of imagination within the everyday experiences of the city. This was certainly the case following the First World War and after the influenza pandemic of that time. And again, following the Great Depression and the Second World War, entire neighborhoods in Vancouver were built with federal government investment. Planning can operate in extremely opportunistic ways. It can bring about colonialism and the Manhattan Project, but can it also bring us public health care, social housing, pensions, employment insurance, and what to make of planning at a time when the world is digitized, financialized, and ecologically brutalized. The possibility of the total mobilization of the state helped reconstitute the field of planning, but it still reeks and performs a parochial, parochial transactionalism today. Mike Harcourt likes to tell the story that most of the Vancouver Planning Department management still had British accents in the early 70s. The amnesias of colonialism still pulsed through the city and set the tempo for its limited field of vision. The world is a slippery place and fundamentally reimagining the future only happens in exceptional times. But the possible movement from uh, transactional forms of planning to transformational planning in such a short period should be welcomed. How do we think beyond and around the state and the pantomime of politics that shape planning? We need to think from within the lived experience of the city and its inhabitants and not be bound by the narrow frame of linear rationalism that the thought of planning is often built upon. In times of crisis, as a number of people have said from Marx to Marshall Berman, all that is solid melts into air. There are some questions to pose in the present crisis and the possibility of a transformational planning to come that functions at the scale of the problems that we now face. What form of planning can be articulated and called upon to defend a public interest in times of multiple crises in the near future beyond the one we're in now? We live in cities with racial and economic injustice as built-in forms of peripheralization that follow from centralized planning decisions that are oftentimes made from flawed or narrow assumptions. In the margins of cities, one can see the collateral damage that poor, poor planning has done in not dealing with the pace and scale of capital flows through the city. The human cost is traumatic and devastating. We don't need to look further than the effects of fentanyl contamination deaths, tent cities, indigenous and Black Lives Matter protests erupting into public space that were decades in the making. Hiding behind the facade of professional rhetoric in the transactional forms of planning that play out every day in urban centers does little other than reproduce the status quo and move the so-called problems around in public space. 
cities need more resources and regulatory power to work around intergovernmental stalemates. Crises perpetuate surveillance tendency of states and the policing of bodies. The next uprisings will also emerge in the suburbs too. The problem is structural inequality. For too long in the region, planning and politics in the service of capital have reproduced and accelerated divides as a normal state of affairs. The disconnection between incomes and housing costs in our cities is but one example. We need to look at new forms of urban indigenous governance and the direct indigenous community governance of social service delivery in urban centers. Planning departments need to be as diverse as the cities they plan for. Not, not much will change without that prerequisite taking place. 80% of Canada's population live in urban centers. How can the pandemic, climate crisis, and future crisis be planned for? And how should recovery be imagined? Who should it be for? How should it land down? Who determines what the recovery looks like and on what terms it rolls out and its attendant effects? For most people, these processes of decision-making are happening in the back room without appropriate forms of engagement. Planning can't be done in a closed room without involving the inhabitants of the city, regardless of their status. Who are we responsible to and who are we held accountable by? The problem of the state is central to any view of planning. For too long, the thinking of planning and its itinerant theories have been sutured to the state. And that has created a fundamental closure of thinking of what might be possible. How can planning rethink its relationship to the state and land politics generally, particularly in urban contexts where originary colonial land theft is still an ongoing reality? Giving back concrete parcels of land to the original inhabitants as part of a process of urban justice and decolonial practices has to be part of that conversation. The urban arena still has the capacity to be an incubator of radical ideas and propositions. The very possibility of liberation within crisis asks a deeper moral question of how to think of a response to crisis outside the state as a place to imagine a radical outside. If the state is the only actor in the response defining the limits of the recovery, then we're ultimately dealing with a parochial form of centralization that is unfortunately baked in with democratic deficits and will exacerbate and accelerate polarization. There needs to be the possibility of agency, participation and decision-making by the inhabitants of the city, rather than just being passive recipients of delegated authority from above. Resilience might just be the bullshit word of the moment. What does a planning that centers social solidarity and social justice look like? If we don't build in the participation of those communities directly affected by decisions, ultimately regulatory force and power decides the outcome. Planning when done well ought to be about reconfiguring power and challenging the surveillance and policing tendencies of state and public bodies. When the pandemic arrived, the existing social safety net was already stripped bare by decades of neoliberal policies. Who gets to imagine what a recovery looks like? Who is in the room? Is contact tracing possible when people don't have a home or a phone? Our public health professionals took a while to land down on whether wearing a mask or not is effective. When public information isn't transparent, trust is eroded. Public health approaches have benefits, but also limitations inherent to centralized forms of planning. Polarization is inevitable and toxic forms of, of population, populism are unleashed. Planning has to be more highly attentive to the production of new solidarities, particularly those that emerge from the periphery. Access to information is limited and isn't multilingual. Some can self-isolate. Charity-based food systems are problematic. And how can we think beyond bricks and mortar solutions? Planners love to build their way out of a problem and building can uh, solve part of the problem, but certainly not all of it. Uh, where's the guaranteed annual income that's needed? Uh, the $375 uh, shelter rate from the provincial government uh, on social assistance rate the, of the 7,000 SROs, less than 100 rent at the shelter rate currently. If this crisis was a test run for a major seismic event where most of our emergency planning goes into uh, at the city, then it means we're not actually prepared. On the whole, the assessment on the ground is that it's been a very disorganized approach. 
government agencies weren't nimble. Its systems are structured on distrust that is couched in an accountability lens. Uh, whereas uh, organizations like the Vancouver Foundation, Van City, United Way, others got 17 million out the door um, uh, quickly. Uh, governments need to pare down systems and focus on empowering community organizations. Communities need to lead and have governments support them. Planning needs more uh, hum humility and not assertiveness. Uh, we also, at the same time as these intense moments unfold in crisis, we need to bring back joy and the good life back to the city as well. In the wake of the pandemic, uh, interesting phenomenon of how people use public space. People are drinking in parks, inhabiting public space in new ways. Patios are enlivened and all of a sudden forms of urban punk uh, or urban funk hitherto unimaginable in the Protestant nanny state of Vancouver and it's overdone, overregulated liquor laws has turned overnight and accepted a messiness that was existing only in other uh, places. I think people want more permit permissiveness in the city to let us be ourselves. What's next? Dogs on patios? Uh, we need investment in the social infrastructure of arts and culture. That's where the solidarity and the poetry of the city resides and the working through of difference takes its audaciously proper form. We want to live in a city that bites back, that fights back, that loves back, that gives back. For Vancouver, the recovery needs to have uh, investment also in the suburbs, especially south of the Fraser. Places like Surrey, um, uh, Brampton in relation to Toronto are the future. That's where the growth is happening. The largest urban indigenous community in Metro Vancouver is currently in Surrey and the city itself will be larger than Vancouver in, in 10 to 15 years. There is explosive growth, but where is the investment in the social glue that binds communities together? Green infrastructure, public transportation, new forms of urbanism and density needs investment in growing suburbs. Density makes public transit efficient. All the precepts of sound urbanism like compact communities, transit oriented or pedestrian oriented development or 15 minute uh, communities uh, make sense intuitively, but here lies the, the caveat. These moves can actually exacerbate peripheralizations and lead to politics of displacement and gentrification in suburban contexts. It can reproduce and accelerate inequality in parts of the city. These urban processes privilege access to capital so the benefits aren't shared. You ever wondered why there's so many real estate billionaires in a small town like Vancouver? What happens when people get displaced from dense urban centers end up commuting from Langley, Abbotsford, Wally, like many of my students have done over the years? It's all well and good to double down on urbanism in a time of crisis, but how does planning deal with that fundamental contradiction that accelerates peripheralization uh, through capital investment? What does a progressive land value capture tax, uh, tax look like uh, in practice, not just in urban centers, but also peripheries? Uh, working from home and other possibilities of technology are certainly differentially uh, experienced as all of us have figured out the past few months. And what does this mean for the future of work? Everyone's home lives are different, but the interruption of the past few months has shown both the upside and downside of this experiment and real challenges to mental health uh, haven't yet been fully understood. We are indeed living simultaneously through the death of an era that was unsustainable and the birth of a new one. There is today an amnesia regarding the upheaval of the world created after World War II. We're grappling with the existential threats of climate change and global scale computation and threats to sovereignty that they pose, just as the possibility of nuclear war hovers over us as a hangover from the last century and toxic forms of populism, nationalism and hatred are all around us and never went away. Humans have proven to be highly adaptable species that thrive on cooperation, even through the deepest divisions and difference. Democracy relies on the messiness and contingency of dissensus, not consensus. It's in our very capacity to live through difference that new solidarities emerge. But to imagine planning in a way that doesn't place sufficient value on both solidarity and dissensus that leaves social, environmental, and racial justice on the back burner is not going to be able to hold the tectonic shifts that are happening all around us. There's a younger generation that is ready to overthrow the system and we should actually welcome them uh, with open arms. It is possible to inhabit a zone of irresponsibility, of messiness, of a resistance to capture and categorization that can coincide 
with uh, a proper confrontation with power in terms of the old ways of working. Insurgent planning, when done well, can be a discipline geared towards a new solidarity, a shared consciousness, a responsibility to an identity beyond oneself, a site where legitimate and illegitimate grievances can be dealt with. How high is the city and how deep is our love? That is the question. And how can we be together and how can we be in common in spite of difference, this is where the work of love for the city and solidarity as a moral position comes to be. And if we can't be in common, how can we still live together? What through difference binds people together in common beyond the shared geography of place? And this is the work for all of us. And if it is to be actualized, it must be done in the everyday with joy, love, poetry, ferocity, velocity, generosity, and solidarity. Thank you.